Hello everyone, welcome to session four here. We get to move on to uh, multiplying by fives. Um, at this point we have looked at our doubles first, multiplying by two and then multiplying by ten, and now we move on to multiplying by five. So we're going to follow the same similar pattern uh, as we did with the first couple sessions. So I'm going to jump right on in here um, just to remind us that uh, the, the pattern that we are following here is looking at the foundational facts, as you can see here on your sheet. Um, so we are entering kind of the second set of facts. Um, if I, I kind of think of twos, tens, and then tens and fives kind of go together, I suppose. Um, but then we get into the times ones and times zeros. Um, and then we will move on to build after we've established that foundation. How do we really build upon that foundation for the, the facts that may be a little more challenging um, for kids? However, we recognize that if our kids don't have these times twos, times tens, times fives, times ones, and times zeros, um, the rest of the facts are much more challenging for them. So let's go ahead and jump right into uh, this presentation. Again, I'm glad to have you with us, and um, let's take a look at where we go from here. Um, we have some natural experiences we would understand um, with fives. Um, in the same way that kids have a lot of background with times ten, they're going to have a lot of that similar background with times five. When you think about five hand, five fingers on a hand, hopefully not five hands on a finger, but five fingers on a hand, five toes on a foot, um, all this counting, even from kindergarten on up, where we're skip counting by fives. So there's just a lot of experiences that kids have with fives that follows after the twos and tens. So if we're thinking about doubling first and then counting by tens, now we're ready to move into those fives. There's just a lot, like you say, of real world connections, including when we get into money, the five nickels, uh, five pennies and a nickel, um, and those kind of things. So as we think about our fives, one of the guiding questions for us and for our kids can certainly be, how does what I know about 10 help me understand my fives? you and I understand probably probably innately or just through a lot of experience that if I understand my tens, I understand that fives are half of that. And so if I know that four times 10 makes 40, well, half of that is going to be 20. So I already know my five times, my five times four, if I knew my four times 10. Um, so kids, it's going to take a while to build that understanding that four times 10 and four times five are highly related to one another, and I can use one to understand the other. Again, just uh, this is a picture from our text, um, and so I'll try to include these as we move on through here because I like what um, I like what we do in the in the text here, in the sense that we can see. All right, so what are we focusing on here? Well, those are our fives, so that takes care of all these facts, and then the grayed out ones here are all the ones we've done so far, so all the known facts. And, of course, what we'll begin to notice is that by the time we get to our more challenging facts, we really, we already know a lot of them by their commutative property. So we can see that after knowing our fives, we'll have these pieces already knocked out and that we'll be ready then to move on to those zeros and ones. And we can see that we end up with really just that really center part of the chart and then just little corners of that chart by the time we're all done with knowing all of our facts. The big ideas with multiplying by five, um, we've already mentioned that multiplying by five is similar to skip counting by five, or in fact, it works the same as skip counting by five. Um, if I can skip count six times, then I know that I can count five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and I know then that, or I can find that six times five is 30. Of course, it's not as efficient as just knowing that six times five is 30, but it is the same process, right? Um, we know that one of the big ideas that repeatedly comes up in this profession development is that our number system is a series of patterns. Um, kids are going to come through, if we, if we really build the conceptual understanding, they're going to see that, or they're going to come to realize that um, all the products of a five fact um, are have a zero or a five in the ones place. So I know then that I'm on track if I'm asking, is this the right product for this, for this number sentence? Um, they also are going to notice that it, alternates even odd even odd and we'll do some of those explorations here in just a few minutes uh, we're also going to find that multiplying a number by five like we talked about is going to be half of what it would be if i multiplied it by 10. Um, we can look at that in terms of fingers on two hands um, tens frames and then looking at that you know a five frame versus a ten frame um, the rows on a hundreds charts all those kind of things and then of course the last big idea 
the commutative property tells us that the order of the, the factors doesn't change the value of the answer. Of course, it changes the number of groups and those kind of things, um, but it doesn't change the value of the answer. Thinking about some questions, um, these may be some really good some really good questions for around the room, for on a board, just as discussion questions as you go through. Um, kind of what patterns do you notice when you multiply by five? Um, how do they connect between the fives and the tens? If I forgot a five fact, how could I use what I know about tens to solve that fact? And then does the order of the factors affect the product? Of course, that goes right back to our big ideas. Um, so the questions that follow up on those. So let's get into a couple of the explorations and then we'll hit our literature connection here. So one thing we want to do for our students is to give them lots and lots of experiences with the multiplication facts. And hopefully we've shown that um, with our multiplying by two and our multiplying by 10 session. Um, so let's think about a piggy bank, right? So this, this uh, activity could be easily adjusted with the number of piggy banks. Um, but basically we're gonna pose a situation where someone, we'll call her Miss Alexander here, um, bought her grandchildren new piggy banks. And she has, she has seven, um, grandchildren a brand new piggy bank and she goes to the bank to get enough pennies because she's going to put five pennies in each of the piggy banks you want to make this more interesting for kids you might make it five dollars or five dollar coins it really doesn't matter um, the the relevance of the five pennies would be the relationship to the nickel of course later but um, in terms of just getting kids into this we could say she wants to get each of her grandchildren five pennies now you and I will notice that we don't give them pictures of seven piggy banks, right? So there's only six here. She's getting seven grandchildren. So we're asking kids to go beyond the picture a little bit. Um, so that may be one stretch for a couple of kids. But we just want them to find, well, if she puts five in each piggy bank, how many is she going to have in all? Um, so as the kids work together, hopefully this is a partner or a group activity, they share out their solutions. You know, you might need to guide some of the kids. How many piggy banks did she have? Because, of course, again, there's only six here on the picture. Um, how did you find that total? Did you count them all? Did you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and count all the way up through the 35? Did you skip count? Were you able to say 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35? Um, or did you add them all up. Did you add 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5? Um, again, recognizing the slight difference that there is there, um, pretty big difference mentally between skip counting and adding. Um, or did anybody multiply? So as the teacher, I would want to know which kids use which strategies because those might kind of help me realize, as the teacher, help my, may help me realize um, which kids are already moving forward with this and which ones are struggling a little bit. Now, you might also have the student who says, I don't need to put them on the piggy bank. If this is a group activity, I would encourage you to encourage them to actually do this because we know that some kids might know seven times five is 35, but they don't know what that looks like. Right? Um, so they don't know that seven groups of five actually is represented this way. So um, we're gonna record that, make sure everybody can see this. Again, these are multiple, we're doing this multiple times, different work mats, different situations, um, but making sure that kids have an idea that um, uh, an idea of how the five facts build. Um, we're going to, since we did this with seven, right now we want to ask kids to go ahead and construct the, a way to represent the, the facts from one piggy bank with five coins in it or five dollars in it all the way up through 10. And of course, this is building uh, the multiplication chart for them. Once they build those charts, then we're looking at um, what kind of patterns do we see? We've mentioned these already, so I won't dwell on them, right? That uh, So these are some of the things we'd want to make sure as the teacher that we're bringing out uh, because some kids are going to see some of the patterns and some kids are going to see different ones, and that's perfectly fine. But by the end of a study, right, we would want them to all recognize all the patterns uh, pretty pretty efficiently if they're going to be fluent with their, with their facts. Um, so we give a couple key questions there. I like the last question here especially. The question again goes back to like we did with doubles, like why is three and three? Why do two odd numbers added together always give me an even number? Why do two even numbers always give me an even number? Um, the same thing here. Um, anytime we're adding that five on, right? Like why why does it alternate odd, even, odd, even? Why isn't it always even like it was with doubles? Um, so just some good questions to connect here. Uh, our story, or our literature connection, um, is Count on Pablo. And this is one of the Math Matters books. Again, I will share that um, 
I this was not a book that I had, um, and so I was able to find it, and I'm sure you can as well, on Amazon for all of a whopping one penny. Um, I think I paid three ninety nine for the shipping or something like that. Um, this is a common book. I don't know. I did not check on Destiny to see how many schools had the book, um, but it's a pretty common book since it's one that Math Matters publishes. So we're going to go through the reading now, um, and so we will do that. And as we do that, uh, we may think about pre-reading activities. We're going to want to make sure that everybody knows that this actually brings in our previous two facts. You're going to see some times two, you're going to see some times ten, and then we're going to introduce the times five facts. Uh, we might want to do a picture walk with kids. We want, this is a different scenario for a lot of kids. We're not too familiar here, unless you go to the farmer's market, with an outdoor market and how that might work and how do people take things there. But most kids are going to be familiar with going to the grocery store um, and understand that some vegetables are sold individually and some are in groups. And so we want them to focus on the size of the groups that Pablo has. Uh, again, just a, the common reminder that during reading, we don't want to get too much into the math, right? Um, we want to make sure that kids just have a chance to explore the reading. And so that's what we'll do here so that you have the experience of, of reading the book. Um, by the way, if you've read the book or you know the story, you can always zoom forward on the, on the reading here. But we would, with kids especially, pause to maybe even write out um, which vegetables are packaged which ways, because that's going to be important later. So um, let me jump over here to uh, our our document camera. So let me throw that up. Let's get it a little bit more centered there for us. And we'll go through and do the reading here for um, for today's literature connection. So the story starts like this. It was market day, and for the first time, Pablo was going to help his abuela, his grandmother, with her market stand. He could hardly wait. Is it time to go? Pablo called. Not yet, said abuela. We can't go until we pick some things to sell. Let's pick fast, said Pablo. Okay, Pablo, abuela laughed. You can pick the limes. Pablo scurried up the lime tree. How many should I pick? Uh, about 20, said Abuela. Nice big ones. As Pablo twisted the limes off the tree, he counted them in a loud voice. One, two, three, four, all the way up to 20. Good counting, Abuela called. Now can we go, Pablo asked. With only limes to sell, said Abuela. She pointed to a bucket. First, we have to wash these onions and tie them in pairs, like this. Abuela made a knot with the tops of two onions. Pablo washed and tied the onions quickly. He got all wet, but he didn't mind. Could you count the onions, Abuela asked. Oh, I'll count them by twos. That's a fast way to count, said Pablo. Listen, Abuela. Abuela listened, and Pablo counted. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six, twenty-eight, thirty, thirty-two, thirty-four, thirty-six, thirty-eight, forty. Good counting, said Abuela. Now can we go? asked Pablo. Not yet, said Abuela. I need you to wash these peppers. Put five in each plastic bag and then tell me how many peppers we have. I'll hurry, Abuela, said Pablo. He washed the peppers very quickly and got even wetter, but that was okay with Pablo. I'll count the peppers by five, said Pablo. That's a faster way to count. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five, forty, forty-five, fifty, fifty-five, sixty, sixty-five, seventy, seventy-five, eighty, eighty-five, ninety, ninety-five, a hundred. Good counting, Abuela called. Now are we ready, Pablo asked. And then he saw Abuela had five buckets of tomatoes. Oh, no, cried Pablo. We'll never get to the market. It's our last job, said Abuela. We just have to wash the tomatoes and put ten in each box. Before long, Pablo had the tomatoes clean and shiny, but he was a muddy mess. I'll count the tomatoes by tens. That's a very fast way to count. Listen, Abuela, said Pablo, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160, 170, 180, 190, 200. Good counting, said Abuela. I almost forgot the cilantro, Abuela said. She tucked a little bunch of the herbs into each box of tomato. Isn't that pretty, Pablo? 
Very pretty, said Pablo. But can we please go to the market now? Abuela shook her head. One more thing needs to be washed. Pablo knew that she meant him. I'll really hurry, he said, and in no time he was all cleaned up and they were on their way. Finally, said Pablo. The market was crowded and noisy. Everywhere Pablo looked, he saw people selling the most wonderful things. There was even a band playing music. There were so many stands. There are so many stands here today, Abuela said. I'll make our stand look the best, said Pablo. Tell me again how many of everything, said Abuela. You count and I'll check. So, after Pablo set up the stand, he counted by tens, by fives, by twos, and by ones. You're a very good helper and a very good counter, said Abuela. Abuela and Pablo waited for shoppers to come. Many people were at the market, but nobody stopped at Abuela's stand. Nobody at all. Pablo began to worry. What if Abuela didn't sell anything? Hours went by. Still, they had not sold a thing. Pablo was getting hungry. May I buy a bag of tortilla chips from Senor Garcia, he asked. Yes, said Abuela. I'm a little hungry, too. Pablo bought a big bag of chips. As he walked back, munching, he thought, I wish I had some. <gasps> Suddenly, he had a great idea. Abuela, he shouted. What is it? asked Abuela. We can make salsa to go with these chips, said Pablo. Everything we need is right here. One lime, two onions, five peppers, ten tomatoes, and a little bunch of cilantro, said Abuela. Making salsa is a wonderful idea, Abuela said. Go buy a pretty bowl from Senora Martinez. I'll borrow two knives and a spoon from Senor Garcia. The minute Pablo returned, he began to chop, chop, chop. Bits of tomato and pepper and onions flew everywhere. Slow down, Pablo, said Abuela. You are chopping too fast. Abuela squeezed the lime juice into the bowl, and then Pablo mixed the bright colors together. Let's taste it, said Pablo. Abuela scooped up some salsa with a tortilla chip and popped it in her mouth. Mmm, delicious, she said. Pablo tasted the salsa, too. It was delicious. Now we'll see what happens when other people taste our salsa, he said. Pablo stood right next to the beautiful bowl of salsa and the big bowl of chips. Taste our delicious salsa, he said. Soon people were crowding around. They tasted the salsa. Delicious, they cried. How did you make this salsa? Pablo told them, you need ten tomatoes, five peppers, two onions, and one lime. And a little bit of cilantro, said Abuela. Then that's what I want, said a man. I do too, said a dozen voices. It was very busy. Then it was very quiet. Abuela's stand was empty. Abuela, said Pablo, we sold everything. 20 limes, 40 onions, 100 peppers, 200 tomatoes, and 20 little bunches of cilantro. I've never had such a busy day, said Abuela. Now, on the market days, shoppers hurry to Abuela's stand. There, they buy everything they need to make Pablo's salsa. Delicious! Of course, at the end, we've got a counting chart, and then we've got um, some different connections. And we're going to go right back into those. So, I hope that if this is a new story to you, that that's um, a good experience for you to see. Um, and if it's a story that you've used before, that you've seen before, that it maybe it's just uh, creates a, a new a new memory or a chance to use this later. So let's think about how could we use um, how could we use the story in our book? We just did the reading, so I don't need to insert a reading here. Um, as we look at our after reading activities, we want to make sure that kids remember the text. We're going to need to probably chart out how many onions, how many limes, all those things. Um, make sure they understand the size of the groups. Um, how did they package tomatoes and the bags of peppers? And so just making sure that everybody grasps onto the sizes because of course those are going to matter um, here as we work through uh, work through working on our five facts. So uh, the literature link activities here, and again we want to build as many connections to the literature as we can 
because this is something we can always reach back into, just like we can reach back into two of everything to talk about our times two facts, and we can reach back into count on Pablo um, as we're looking at our um, times five facts later, uh, and well now and later with our kids, because this can be a memory experience for them. So we're going to give kids ideally some transparent counters. If you don't have transparent counters, of course it's fine to use two different objects. You can use like a bean and a pea or two a paper clip and a bean, those kind of things you might just have around that are relatively easy and relatively inexpensive. Um, so we're going to look at uh, using transparent counters ideally. Uh, probably one color like red to show our times 10 facts. And of course that's because the reds were tomatoes um, and the time the tomatoes were in groups of 10. So we're going to say, okay, let's put counters on our 10s, right? Our 10 tomatoes, 20 tomatoes, 30 tomatoes, 40 tomatoes, 50 tomatoes. Um, and so we've got those marked out. And we say, do you remember those? Let's go ahead and write those multiplication sentences out. Well, that would be one group of tomatoes or one group of 10, two groups of 10, three times 10, all the way up through. Um, really just remembering again, well, how many tomatoes would be in three boxes? Well, it'd be 30. Um, and this is a good chance now that hopefully by this or at this point kids are comfortable with the tens facts and they've been practicing them for a while um, and this is a good chance to introduce the term multiple right? because multiple has multiple meanings um, and so in math when we're talking about multiples and we're talking about factors and products and all these terms start to get mixed together for kids that a multiple is a synonym for a product. And it's usually the word that we'll use as we get more, more efficient and more, uh, more formal in our math language. So we're gonna be talking about multiples of five, not necessarily the products of five. So we've got our red counters now on our tens. We're gonna say, okay, let's go ahead and take those off. Um, and now let's use a different color. So let's talk about the peppers. And of course the peppers are green. So if we have green transparent counters, we can slide those on here. And if you don't, we could certainly just use uh, something different to represent the peppers. Um, so would we be putting those on the tens? And some kids may say, no, because there are, he has five in each bag. And then, okay, well, let's go ahead and put them in there. And some kids might say, well, you're gonna put them on some tens. So we want kids to start to think about why or why not. Why would they be on the tens? Why would they not? Where are we going to place them and how would we know? Well, how do we know there's five in each bag? Um, and now let's review our five facts, right? So if he has one bag of peppers, well, that's going to be on the five and then it's going to be on the ten. Um, and so we go ahead and we put those down. We're going to record the multiplication facts. We're going to talk about the multiples of five. Um, so now we've had a chance to review our tens and our fives. And let's take a look real quickly then at how about where do these both fall? Right? And you are probably already going there in your mind. Um, why not just keep the tens on there to begin with? Well, we want to make sure that we're giving multiple chances to remember and practice um, our facts here. And at this point, you'd have to know, are all my kids there with their tens facts and the five facts? Um, but we could do this without being completely fluent, but you wouldn't want to give the, do this too early um, if kids were still struggling with their five facts. Or sorry, about their ten facts. Um, so we've got our tens on there. We're going to now lay back our greens. So we've got our greens and our red counters on here. And we want to look at, well, why are they both on 10? Why, why does that happen? Why are they both on 20, 30? Um, we start to see common multiples. Probably too early for the term common multiple. We start realizing that some facts are going to overlap, right? So we look at um, why are some of them multiples of 5 and 10? Well, this might be where we start to make that connection between why well, your five facts, your five factors are half of the ten, so every other one is going to be on a ten. So if we're if we're if we're going to continue on, or if this is a new a new day, I guess I should say, um, because again this makes it seem like we're doing this all back to back to back, but this could certainly be done over days or even weeks. Um, we clear off the chart if we're just continuing. We start talking about well, if Pablo sold eight pairs of onions, where would that be? And again, we haven't gone back and done our twos, but we could have done that as well. Five boxes of tomatoes, where would that be? Four bags of peppers, where would that one be? And then how do we write our multiplication sentences for that? So we're getting to practice our twos and our tens, and we're getting to introduce our five facts. Um, and again, depending on your level of kids, um, you might want to have little baggies of the manipulative like five green unifix cubes or two white unifix cubes for the onions and 
10 red ones for the for the tomatoes just depends how much of that physical concrete connection they might need then we build up to a more a more rigorous a more in-depth kind of question like Pablo has 23 peppers and can he sell them all in groups of five and why or why not and let's let's pose the the, the fictitious student Danny right Danny says sure he can um, that 23 is a multiple of five or he could just make a bag that only had three in it and is that okay um, so getting kids to really talk about well can you can you get 23 equal or get equal groups of five from 23 um, obviously that would be really connecting even into division here as we continue to go with our kids right we want to make sure that um, we're giving them lots of experiences lots of chances to solve different kinds of questions it's great to have the literature connection to keep coming back to and then we've got to diversify right? so we've got to look at um, giving kids a variety of scenarios that look a lot the same they have a lot of the same numbers in them um, so we we have these team problem solving cards that are in the text right so uh, in these we're working in teams um, typically teams of three to four um, they've got to write a multiplication equation and also show the solution in one other way so depending on uh, how how adept your kids are you might need to tell them here are some different ways you can show me um, you can show me using the multiplication sentence that's one you have to do and then you can use manipulatives you can do a drawing you can skip count you could do the addition sentence you can show me another way to solve it other than the first way that you've got and again we're working in teamwork this isn't necessarily this isn't really homework this is how can i make you more flexible in your mathematical thinking so when you get stuck you have another way to go at a problem uh, let's Apologize for the misspelling of time in there. Um, but kids can do, or we can do these multiple cards. So if this group gets done quicker, they can get another problem. I'm not going to give them all eight problems at once. Um, you could certainly make up your own problems. Um, it would be easy to, easy to create different situations. Um, and again, this is one of the handouts um, that you'll get um, in the digital downloads from the text if you choose this text. Thinking about other ways that we support all learners, chanting math facts. Um, so chanting, singing, rhythmic rhythmic talking through things. There is some power in that, especially for kids who have attention challenges and other learning difficulties. It's perfectly fine to practice saying our math facts, to work through them, to say them back and forth, one student to another, let's go back and forth, let's say them this many times, let's make those assignments where you're gonna recite them to your parents. Those are, those are great, they just can't be the only thing. So I don't wanna confuse because early on we talked about not, not just doing math facts, back and forth three times five is 15 three times six is 18 uh, there is power in saying it out loud and hearing it all those pieces but not if i can't picture it and not if i don't know what that actually means so the caution here is that fluency i can recite them off really fast um, but fluency is only one part of mastery right you also need that conceptual understanding um, otherwise memories leave us and then we're stuck um, Connecting again with our with any struggling kids, making connection to money groups. All those ideas that we shared in the multiply by ten can easily be modified for multiplying by five. Nickels and cents, connecting the number of nickels to the number of cents. So we've got some sheets that might look like this, right? That looks very similar to when we had our dimes to dollars. Now we're talking about nickels and dimes and how those two connect. And then the number of nickels and how many cents does that make and how do you know and can you draw it out and so again these are both in the in the digital downloads for you um, time is another one where where groups of five come in quite often and it, again this is an easy station activity to set up um, we have you know everything from one times five to twelve times five right there in front of us um, and you can certainly count your way around the clock if you need to the five minute increments is a good way to practice time because we know a lot of kids don't have a lot of practice with the clock. Um, so if the clock is a barrier, you want to use it not as a support, but as a way to learn time. Um, but if it's if it's something that they know very, or the student knows very well, it can certainly be an asset to talk about. Well, what time is it when the when the long the large hand is on the nine, and how can I use my 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 times five facts to help me there, uh, or even skip counting by fives. As we look at building automaticity, we need some games, we need station activities, we need things that kids can do, sorry for that, we can, that kids can do again and again and again. 
Um, and so corners is one of these activities, right? So there is a spinner. We'll show you the spinner here in a second. So we have a spinner that looks like this. So you're going to spin it and say I get uh, my spinner lands on six. I'm going to multiply six times five. And that means I get to mark out 30 somewhere on my chart. Now you'll notice 30 is in a bunch of places, right? So I'm going to put a counter on this 30, right? And so then I would hit my spinner again. And if I got the five, then I can mark out this 25. And again, we might have four or five of us. Ultimately, I'm going to end up with different marks in different places, right? But what I really want, whoever gets four that makes a square or a rectangle together that makes four corners, it wins the game, right? So they, I would definitely have kids write out the facts as they got them, um, and not just the ones that make their four corners, but every single spin as they go through. So that's one called corners. Uh, another way is to use our, our chart. Uh, we can call this a ratio table, a function table. Um, a lot of times in early grades, we call it input output. If I put this in, what comes out? Um, helping kids realize though these are really function tables. I mean, that's, that's the beginning of algebra right here, right? So, because um, this is a graph, right? This is my x-axis and my y-axis. And if you really want to graph it out, that's kind of fun too. Um, you can see that it makes a line on a graph. Um, so we're looking at, well, let's see, if I put one in there, one times five gives me this, two times five gives me that. And then let's look at those patterns again. Do we notice the even odd pattern? Do we notice the ends of five, ends in zero pattern? And we're trying to keep coming back to a lot of a lot of scenarios for kids that they can make sense of and remember. So we can come up with other scenarios where they're going to have these groups of five, like the five points on a star. So if I have this many stars, how many points am I going to have? If I have this many feet, how many toes am I going to have? How many fingers on a hand, how many how many pennies in a nickel, those kind of things. Um, so if I have one nickel, how many pennies do I have? Um, all those are good ways to practice building automaticity. Um, fact card arrays, um, I'm a big fan of arrays and kids and having kids build the arrays again and again and again. Um, so giving kids their times five fact cards um, that look something like this, right? Um, and build the array that goes with it. So they might pull a times five fact card, they build the array, um, I like hanging these up um, because I think it's good for kids to look up and see uh, the facts all around them. So they're going to count the rows, they're going to count the columns. You might want them to label that, that, you know, this is a five by what is it, six, seven, five by seven. Um, that would be 35. Um, that, and then ultimately what we're helping kids realize is that I can count all 35 of those, but there are certainly more efficient and fast ways to do this. Um, in terms of building automaticity, again, we need lots and lots and lots and lots of practice. Um, lots of different stations. Some kids are going to gravitate towards some more than others. Doesn't mean you have to do all these. Um, and you certainly have some that many that you've probably used already. Fact card reviews. Again, if my kids already know their twos and their tens, if they're good with those. I'm going to make, I'm going to put these into their personal deck. So now when they're practicing with their partners, they're adding in fives and they're now they're up to three sets. They can be we want cumulative review, and we also want focused review with kids, right? Um, but there are lots of ways to do it other than time tests, right? So um, looking at drawing an array of the fact, writing the repeated addition sentence, writing a story for the fact. So what, what would be a story that matches five times three? What we want to do ultimately is we want kids to be efficient. Uh, we want them to be quick, but we want that to be based in the concept and that they know what it means. So if we do a lot of these activities, then we build that concept in the mind instead of just remembering five times three is 15. It's important to monitor progress, right? I think both, both parents and students need to know uh, where they are with making progress toward facts. Um, again, we talked about fact checks, could be just that current fact. We wanna just practice our times fives. Um, and sometimes we wanna practice our cumulative facts. So it's good. I've seen folks with their with their individual fact cards make them in either different colors or put a different color dot on uh, the different facts so that if they're just doing the times fives, they know find just the green ones or find just the whatever color it happens to be, whatever it's marked with. Big remembrance though is that automaticity is going to take time. There's no there's no quick way to build long remembering. As we get close to the end here, we always want to come back to division. We don't want to forget uh, the partner to multiplication and that being division. Um, any of the activities that we've done with multiplication can easily be modified to make uh, work for division. Um, 
so some examples there, you know, Pablo and his grandmother put five peppers in each bag. We know that scenario from the story. Pablo has 30 peppers. Sorry, I didn't know if he has there, but Pablo has 30 peppers. How many bags does he need? He has 45 peppers in the bag. How many bags of peppers? Uh, lots of partner work, uh, lots of manipulative work. When kids start to realize that if I drew the array to multiply, that same array is what I'm going to see when I divide. Like, oh, the rows and the columns, they, they're the same. It's just whether I'm talking about the dots in the middle, or am I talking about how many rows and how many columns? Um, that, that can be a, a real freeing moment for kids. Divide and go is another activity. So we have a spinner that looks like this. So the kids are going to spin that spinner. Um, they're going to divide the answer by five. And now instead of, uh, so we have this hundreds chart, right? So instead of uh, writing down the answer, we're going to say, well, if you got 15, you're going to say 15 divided by 5, and if I can get that right, and I know that's 3 because 3 times 5 is 15, or however I figured that out, then I get 3 points. So the, the, the quotient, the answer to my division sentence, is how many points I get. So if I got 15, then I get to move up to 3. Even if the next time I get 30, then I do 30 divided by 5, well, that's 6 more. right? So I get to move from the 3 up to... I get to move six more, one, two, three, four, five, six, and now I'm on nine. So you get lots and lots of practice by finding all those quotients, and the first person to get exactly to 100 went. Um, and you could certainly change this. You can make it a 50 board, or you can make it longer. You can make it the least number of steps, all those kind of things. However you want to make it uh, to make it more interesting for the kids. But this is a good one. Um, the kids will practice without realizing that they're practicing. Same thing, looking for the patterns in our input-output, really our function table here, um, recognizing that we have the same kind of patterns as we had in multiplication. Um, we aren't going to ask you um, with this one again, just like we didn't with the times tens. Um, we're not going to ask you to do anything specific with this other than to let us know that you have watched this session um, and to share any resources that you have or that you've created. And we'll move into... The next presentation will be on multiplying by one, and then we'll go to multiplying by zero, and that'll take us through all of our foundational facts. So um, again, I'm Michael Elder, and I say thank you for being with us during this time, and hopefully this has given you a few more, uh, a few more tools to use in your class. And please do share with the rest of our group the tools that you've created or that you just have come to use over the years with your kids, especially as they relate to multiplying by five.